Good morning, everyone. So I get to talk about some of the things that shipped in Unity 5.1. And I could actually, uh, I could just be here for hours. I could talk about, you know, new platform support for Tizen or the SketchUp importer or like all the polish that the animation window has. But I only, you know, I only have maybe 10 minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about a new feature that we built in Unity 5.1. We built it from scratch, and it's a network and multiplayer feature that makes it easy for you guys to turn you know, a normal kind of game into a multiplayer game. And the way I'm going to do that is by starting with a short demo. So I have a cartoony little scene right here, like that. And I have a tank prefab that I'm going to drag into the scene. I'm going to hit play and drive around for a little bit. So, you know, if you bear with me and exercise a little bit of imagination, you could say that this is a pretty fun single player game. <laughs> and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through the steps that you would need to do to turn this single player thing into a multiplayer thing. So I'm going to select my tank here. And the first thing I'll do is I'll add a component. I'll add the network transform component. So the network transform component, its job is to synchronize position and rotation of this tank across all the different connected clients. Um, it's, uh, it's configured to send nine position updates per second. Now I'm going to up that a little bit, like that. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new game object, which I'm going to call Network Manager. I'm going to add the Network Manager component to that. OK, so this Network Manager component, it's a very high-level component. The primary purpose of it is just to allow you to get started quickly. And one of the things that you can tell it is which prefab to use for each of the connected players. So I'm going to add my tank prefab there. And I'm going to remove this tank that I put here in the beginning. And then we're going to see you know, uh, if, this, uh, if this is going to work. So the way this works, I'm going to hit uh, play mode in the editor. I'm going to start the editor as a host. And then I'm going to connect with my client here. And I can drive around. So you know, the, uh, it's not so bad for two minutes. It, you know, it connects. Uh, you can drive around. But if you look closely, there's also a bunch of problems. I'm controlling the, the player window in the right bottom over there. And if you pay close attention, you'll see that both tanks are actually responding to my keyboard input. So that's not good. And if you look at the tank that I'm driving around in the game view of the editor, you can see that the position updates are pretty good, but that the rotation updates are actually all wrong. You know, like the, the tank's pretty much driving sideways like that. OK, so let's see what we would have to do to solve these problems. Let's start with the input problem. So. Why do we actually have this problem of input? It's because 60 seconds ago, this was still a single player game. <laughs> and it had the, the tank had a script that, you know, as in all single player games, it listens to the inputs, and then it applies the input to the tank. But what we want to do for the multiplayer version is that we're going to trust the networking system to deal with the position and rotation updates for all the other tanks. And we want the, the tank movement script to only process the input for the tank that we're actually controlling. So let's see how we do that. I'm going to take this tank movement script. I'm going to make it derive from network behavior. And then I happen to already know where the input code is. Uh, it's these two lines. And what I'm going to say is just, uh, if we are not the local player, then we're not going to do anything. So we're only going to process this input here if we are the local player. I'm going to do the same thing down here, because there's a bit more code that also deals with input here. OK, so that's input. What was the other problem again? It was the rotation of the tank. So I mentioned before that it's the responsibility of this network transform component to deal with rotation and position updates. So if they're broken, probably that guy is also to blame. So let's take a look. The network transform component here, it has a rotation section. 
and it has an interpolate rotation setting that for our game is way too low at once. So I'm just going to put that to 10. And while I'm here, I'm also going to make a small optimization. I'm going to promise this system that our tank will only ever rotate around the y-axis. I know that because it's uh, kind of a top-down uh, game. And that allows the networking system to save some bandwidth because it doesn't have to send all these zero rotation uh, information all the time. All right, let's see, if, uh, let's see if that actually worked. I'm going to run my server in the editor again. And connect. Move out of the way. I'll be driving. And what do you know? Only one tank responds to my input. And uh, the rotation updates of the tank are actually pretty good. OK, so that's starting to look like something. Let me see what happens if I try to add a modest amount of gameplay here. And you know, since I'm not big into tanks shooting other things, I actually made a very hippie tank color script that makes the tank, when you drive into a trigger, it comes up with a random color, and it applies that color to the tank. So let me go back to my tank. And I'm going to add this tank color script over here. And now the only thing that I still have to do is I have to add a trigger to the scene. And I'm going to just use this building over here. Oh, look, I already had one. Let me remove that. I'm going to add a box collider here. I'm going to make that a trigger. And I'm going to edit it. Notice that we now have these sexy little like collider modification thingies, gizmo. Do you call them gizmos? I don't really know. But it makes it easy to place the box collider. Um, and uh, let's, uh, let's do another multiplayer build of that and see what the effect of this script is on the game. So we're going to run this guy again. And we're going to run it here. And I'm going to drive this tank into the building and see what happens. What do you know? It kind of works. I drive into the building and I get assigned a random color. But of course, this tank color script is attached to the tank on both clients. And on both clients, you hit the building. And then on both clients, you get assigned a random color, but not necessarily the same one. So there's two things that you could do about this. The first thing that you could do is that you do absolutely nothing, <laughs> which is my preference. It's usually my preference of choice, but also in this case, because you would be surprised at how much stuff you can get away with in terms of showing different players different versions of the world while they're all thinking about the same thing. Like you, you'd think like, oh no, like it has to be all, it has to be exact and everything, but once you start developing a multiplayer game, you realize that it's actually very hard to make it exactly the same for everyone. And then when you try it, it turns out in many cases, it really doesn't matter. But that would make for a boring demo. So I'm going to synchronize the colors anyway. So let's go to this tank color script again. I'm going to make this guy derive from network behavior. And I'm going to uh, use a feature from the networking system that's called SyncVar. So what SyncVar does is it makes it the responsibility of the networking system to synchronize the value of this m color variable across all the different clients. And it has an additional feature where you can specify a hook function. So I could say, Hook is apply color. And what that does is that whenever a SyncVar update comes in over the network, uh, this apply color function over here gets called. And the way that these SyncVars work is they always get sent from the server to the clients. So what we're going to do is we're going to make the server authoritative when it comes to whether or not you actually hit the building and also which color you're going to get. So that means that I'm going to add a check here that if I'm not the server, I'm not going to do anything. And if I am the server, I'm going to set the M color here. And the action of setting this M color, it will trigger the sync var update to all the clients. And if we are a client, we go into the return here. We don't do anything because we trust the networking system. To we trust the server in the network to send us the sync var update. And the sync var update will call this apply color here, we'll which will actually change the color of the tank. All right, so let's see if that actually worked. Always 
always a surprise. I'm going to start this as a server and connect this guy and run into the building. What do you know? The server dictates whether or not we hit the building and it sends out the new random color to both clients and uh, it works. Awesome. All right, so that's, where's my clicker? So that's, you know, a short glimpse of how you would, um, how you can, you know, in 10 minutes take a single player thing into a multiplayer thing. And as I did this, you've seen me use very high level components like the transform component and the network manager and high level APIs. And that's really great because these high level components, they allow you to get started very quickly. They allow you to find the fun in your game before you have to spend weeks of doing network programming. For instance, I would very quickly find out that this tech game isn't any fun because you drive into buildings and you change colors and it's no fun. And I throw the whole thing away and that saves me, you know, it would have been sad if I would have spent two weeks doing network programming before I had to figure that out. However, when your project gets further into the production, often these very high level systems, they don't do exactly the thing you want. You know, at some point you, you reach a point where you need some more customization or you know, some optimization. And one of the things that I really like about the design of the networking system is that these high level components that we have, they're actually implemented in C Sharp and we'll have the source code available for them and they are implemented on top of a very low-level networking API. And this low-level networking API is also public. So that means you can start with the high-level stuff, get started quickly, but once you reach a point where you want to you know, make an optimization yourself, like, you know, uh, like the thing I did with the rotation, you can actually get your hands dirty and can get all the way down to the, like, the bits that we send over the sockets and talk to this low-level API, which deals with you know, all this stuff like multiple channels with different reliability guarantees and ordered and not ordered, all that stuff that's great that it's available when you need it, but that's also great to not have to worry about when you don't. If you want to learn more about uh, the networking system and not only the tools that I've shown, but also the services that we provide with it, the matchmaking service to help your players find other people to play with, and the relay server that helps players behind firewalls connect to other players. Uh, there's two talks tomorrow. One is by Eric Yule. I think it's in this room. Uh, he'll go much more in depth on, into the networking system. And there's a talk by Tyler Lagrange. I hope I say that right, Tyler. And he has been developing a game uh, uh, for a long time now while we have been developing the networking system. So it's a project that has really dog-fooded the, the networking system, and it's a post-mortem talk. Uh, so I'm sure you know, if you want to learn more about networking, that would be a great place to learn f uh, about some, uh, some war stories in the wild. All right, so that's networking. The other feature, highlight feature, that I want to talk about in Unity 5.1 is VR. Now, VR, virtual reality, is a completely new way for people to interact with the computer, for people to interact with the simulation. And with this complete new, new thing also come a lot of challenges. You know, not, not the least is that everything we did on a desktop computer no longer works. You know, on a desktop computer, having a button is a pretty reasonable thing to do, but in VR, is a button really you know, the most reasonable way to present the choice to a user? You know, and I won't even begin about you know, using a keyboard and mouse. So I'm convinced that if we were able to look forward in time five years from now, and if we were to see what kind of experiences we have with VR and what kind of interaction models these have, I'm convinced that these things still have to be invented. And I'm convinced that they still have to be invented by you. And the only, thing, only way I know how to do that is to just try and try and try many different things and see what sticks. And that happens to be exactly the kind of thing that Unity is really good at. So starting with Unity 5.1, there is out-of-the-box support for VR, for the Oculus and the Gear VR. And we will continue to work to make sure that Unity is the best development environment to experiment with VR. 
The best development environment to fail fast. The best development environment to just, you know, to try hundreds and hundreds of things and, you know, help you on this search to find the kinds of experiences and the kind of interaction models that work with VR. So, that's all nice. Unity 5.1, you know, uh, it comes with a whole lot of nice, uh, nice new features. But when we go to conferences like this, and when we walk around the show floor and talk to all you guys, what we hear a lot is, well, you know, it's nice that you go on stage and talk about all these features that shipped in 5.1, but we really need to have some more information about what's coming next, you know? What's coming in three months? What's coming in six months? What are you guys, you know, what are you guys doing with this feature? Like, these nested prefabs, are you guys ever going to do them? Or what, like, what's, <laughs> what is going on with that? Um, <laughs> and I'm happy to say that going forward, we will be sharing our internal roadmap with all of you. In fact, I'm happy to say that it's live today at this URL. And at this URL, you will find what we have scheduled for Unity 5.2, what we have scheduled for Unity 5.3, for 5.4, and beyond. And it will also list different confidence levels. Like some of the features, we're going to be pretty confident that, that, we, you know, that we'll be able to ship them in a certain release. But there's also features that maybe we're not quite sure of. Or you know, maybe we showed them to some of you, and you told us that we made completely the wrong thing, and that we should try again. So those ones would, would be orange. You'll be surprised at how often that happens. For instance, with the nested prefabs. <laughs> we actually had a version once, and we showed it to a group of people, and they told us we were all wrong, and we had to start all over. So we are unable to precisely predict the future. You know, it's, we would be lying if we'd say that you know, everything on here is going to happen exactly the way we predict it. But what we can do and the next best thing that we can do is that we can share with you what we know so that you guys can make more informed decisions for your business going forward. 